Okay, sorry for the brief delay. Um, with technical difficulties. We're going to take the pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker for uh, this afternoon, Professor Robin Zhao from uh, the Department of Civil Engineering. So, Robin received his bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo in 2009 in uh, civil engineering and followed that up with a master's degree at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT. Uh, in 2012, again in the civil and environmental engineering. Now followed with a PhD again at the MIT, which she completed in 2017. Doctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto in the mechanical and industrial engineering department. And in 2018, we were fortunate to recruit him to the uh, civil engineering. It's it's working, but it's not for this. Uh, in so oh, other words, uh, uh, okay, okay. it's a really exciting research program uh, focused on multi-phase flow and transport of porous materials and how this can uh, help mitigate carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And so today he's going to present his work on variability control of multi-phase flow and porous media uh, with applications to the energy system. So I pass over the floor to you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank you all for being here. Again, my name is Robin Zhao, and I'm from the Civil Engineering Department. Uh, it's a pleasure to present here today. And the topic of my presentation today is wettability control on multi-phase flowing porous media. And specifically, uh, I'll try to tailor my talk to applications to the energy system. Okay, so first, a brief overview of my research group. This is a picture that we took last summer uh, when the weather is so nice and we can all wear short sleeves. Um, so uh, we have uh, uh, many students and there are a variety of projects that we're working on currently and I can only talk about a couple. So let's um, give you a brief uh, sneak preview of some of the other projects that we're working on, uh, starting with uh, water infiltration. So when uh, water, uh, when the rain contacts the soil and it slowly percolates downwards, um, we can see the water travels in these channelized flow and that's due to a gravitational instability. So we're using a macro scale micro model to study this process where we can visualize the fluid phenomenon at the pore scale and also at the macro scale. So another project that we're working on is mineral precipitation in confined spaces. Um, so here, what you're looking at is the injection of calcium chloride into uh, a solution of sodium carbonate. You can see the interaction uh, between uh, fluid dynamics and reaction kinetics um, help to create this kind of uh, interesting precipitation patterns. So another project that we uh, have been working on, and that's in collaboration with Kari, who's uh, sitting in the audience here. So we're able to engineer these polymer beads that have different wetting properties. So going from left to right, you can see uh, we placed a water droplet on this polymer bead, and the left, the water is very much uh, does not like the bead, whereas so we go from left to right, you can see uh, in the middle, the water is able to pull up the bead due to capillary interaction. And at the very right, see the water likes to be so much that it completely encapsulate the bead. So another project that we are actively working on is digital rock characterization using machine learning. So we started with computational fluid dynamics simulations in very high resolutions. And then we uh, complete, completed a massive number of these simulations. And then we feed the simulation results into a uh, convolutional neural network and using the convolutional neural ne network, we're able to predict the properties and the properties that we have worked on so far is the permeability of the porous material and also the thermal conductivity of the porous material. So another, another project that we're working on is um, gas nucleation in electrochemical devices. So here we're using a thermodynamics based approach where we start with a solution 
and then we gradually increase the saturation of the gas species. In this case, it could be oxygen or the hydrogen. And at some point, uh, these um, supersaturated solutions is going to nucleate gas bubbles, and we want to understand where the gas bubbles come from and what happens to the gas bubbles after they warm into the gaseous phase. And just in the past couple of years, uh, we started looking at aerosol flow and how we can engineer better masks to control uh, the release of aerosols into the environment. And again, that's to uh, protect the uh, public health. So in addition to sort of the micro scale physics phenomenon that we study, uh, we also think about uh, large or larger scale problems. And on the left here, uh, we, I'm showing a project that we're, we're working on. Um, so trying to look at the techno-economic analysis of carbon capture and storage in the Alberta oil sands. So some of the questions that we ask is, okay, whether the um, sailing aquifers in Alberta has the capacity to store all the CO2 um, produced by the Alberta oil sands. And because the rate of oil sand production is not uh, constant, it's not linear. So um, that has implications on the rate of injection. So even if we have an aquifer that have enough capacity, whether they can sustain the rate that is needed to store the CO2 uh, is an open question. So uh, that's something that we're looking at. We're also looking at uh, what is the cost uh, of the pipelines that is needed to transport the CO2 emissions from these oil sand producers into the sailing aquifers and how much that's going to cost and also whether that is consistent with the amount of funding and the tax incentives that the uh, federal government and the provincial government is providing. And uh, lastly, uh, we are currently looking at uh, greenhouse systems. So uh, that's a work led by Michelle who's sitting right in front of me. Uh, she is looking at modeling the greenhouse as a dynamic system and uh, playing around with the different modules and see whether we can optimize uh, greenhouse systems so they become as close to a closed loop system as possible so we don't waste uh, resources. Okay, so I just mentioned that our group uh, mostly focuses on multi-phase flow in porous media. So then the question is, okay, what do we mean by multi-phase flow in porous media? Because these two words uh, means different things to different people. So we define multi-phase flow as the simultaneous flow of emissible fluids. So some everyday examples are shown here. For example, on the image on the left, we have olive oil in water. In the middle, we have um, CO2 gas uh, in a can of Coke. On the right, we have some milk droplets um, in air. And the commonality between these systems uh, is that they're immiscible, which means they don't dissolve each other. And as a result, they're separated by sharp interfaces. And these sharp interfaces are subject to capillary forces. Okay, so that's multi-phase flow. So what do we mean by porous media? So a porous media is a solid matrix with pores and porous media is prevalent uh, on our planet going from geological porous media on the left, such as the sandstone to synthetic one as a sponge that we use um, every day and to a biological porous medium uh, such as wood. So one common aspect of all these porous materials is that they contain pore spaces and that allows fluid flow. So that's what we study. So um, the title of my talk says that uh, it has some implications for um, energy systems. And some of the examples that I would like to draw on, uh, number one, uh, geological carbon sequestration, uh, where we collect CO2 from uh, large point sources, such as you know, oil sands or a coal, far, coal power plant. Uh, but more recently, it also can be uh, direct air capture of CO2. And we collect these CO2 and then we inject them underground into these porous rocks or uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery uh, and um, renewable energy storage, such as hydrogen storage. So one example that I'll talk about is CO2 enhanced oil recovery. And um, CO2 is injected into oil reservoirs to displace hard to extract oil deposits. 
So it might be a little bit counterintuitive because we're trying to save the planet, but then again, uh, what I'm talking about here is to ingest CO2 to get more oil out. But it turns out that uh, injection of CO2 into uh, underground reservoirs actually achieves a net sequestration of CO2 in the sense that more carbon atoms is locked underground than what is released when the recovered oil is burnt. So currently, this is the major application of um, CO2 uh, in terms of uh, energy resources. OK, so the title of my talk today uh, is going to be mainly focused on wettability effects. So let's define what we mean by wettability, which is a measure of a liquid's affinity to a solid surface. So uh, I have two images here uh, on the left. Uh, water is wetting to this countertop, and you can see that the water spreads into a thin film. That means that the water likes the solid, which is the countertop. And on the right, uh, we have an image where water is non wetting to the lotus leaf. You can see that the water beats into a spherical shape. Then another couple of terminology that's specific to hydrogeology and petroleum engineering is drainage, and that simply refers to when a non-wetting fluid invades and displaces a wetting fluid. Another terminology is imbibition, and that means the uh, wetting fluid invades and displaces a non-wetting fluid. So some of the classical examples uh, that study the impact of wettability on multi-phase flow in porous media have shown that indeed wettability uh, plays a major role. So specifically, in this uh, classic paper by Stokes et al. that was published in Physical Review Letters in 1986, they have shown that going from drainage to inhibition, the displacement pattern broadens. So you get these fingering morphologies, but the width of the finger is different. So uh, on the top image here, uh, we have the invading fluid that is more wetting to the porous media and you can see that the finger width is much larger than a typical pore size, whereas in the bottom image, the invading fluid is non-wetting to the porous media, then the finger width is on the order of, uh, on the order of pore size. You can see that simply changing the wettability of the porous medium, we get drastically different patterns. So then what we did was we wanted to study this problem a little bit more systematically, and specifically, we designed experiments in microfluidic cells to study this problem. And uh, the uh, advantage of microfluidic cells is that we have a more controlled geometry. And in our R system, the microfluidic cells are patterned with circular posts. So circular posts mimics the grains of particles in the porous media. Um, so one thing I would like to note that our post pattern contains disorder locally, but at the macro scale, it is homogeneous. So this is a uh, typical schematic of our device. So to make these microfluidic cells, uh, we use a polymer called NOAA81. And it's a photo, photo curable polymer that has a special property in the sense that when it is um, subjected to high energy UV ozone radiation, uh, it becomes more hydrophilic. So we have this NOAA 81 surface that is patterned with posts. On the top, we have another NOAA 81 surface that is flat. Uh, then we conduct fluid flow in the gap between the two surfaces. And the gap in our system is 100 microns. So 100 microns is where the fluid flow takes place. And what we do is we first saturate the uh, microfluidic flow cell with a viscous silicon oil, and then we inject water to displace this silicon oil. And if we were to calculate the viscosity ratio of the system, where viscosity ratio is defined by the viscosity of the oil divided by the viscosity of the water, then the ratio is 350. So that means that we have a viscously unfavorable system. So the water is much less viscous than the silicon oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that just to have the quantitative the chamber? Exactly. So, so we made these posts use, uh, using photoethography. Um, so 
the post size is supposed to be 100 microns everywhere. But in the fabrication process, they're not all of them 100 microns. So we might have like 98 micron or 99 micron. So, but uh, if they're uh, completely uh, rigid, then we would have a gap of say one micron where the fluid flow can can go on the top. So, so, so then we thought about this problem a lot, and, and in the end, we feel like having a thick PDMS layer would able to give us enough uh, pressure so that the top plate is touching all the posts. So we don't have flow over the top. Then it becomes, uh, instead of a quasi-2D problem, it becomes a 3D problem. It becomes a little harder to study. Okay, um, so uh, like I mentioned before, we use this polymer called no ID one and by changing the amount of UV that we uh, subject to this polymer, we're able to achieve a wide range of contact angles. So going from left to right, uh, we have contact angle of under 50 all the way to seven. So we call under 50 degree contact angle strong drainage. And again, that's because the water is non wetting to the uh, solid. And when the contact angle is seven, we call this strong inhibition. And that's because the water is strongly wetting to the solid. Uh, again, to characterize our experiments, we define uh, what's referred to as a capillary number, and that's a dimensionless number that characterizes the relative importance between uh, viscous forces and capillary forces, and we uh, reach a two orders of magnitude of capillary number. So this is a movie of a typical experiment. So this is a drainage experiment at a high capillary number. And you'll see that the invading water sort of forms these dendritic patterns that is very prototypical of viscous fingering. And you'll see that the water has a color and the color has a meaning. Uh, so the color bar here refers to the gap average saturation of water. So here we see that the red color corresponds to approximately 50%. So that means that 50% of the 100 micron gap is now saturated with water and the rest is still oil, okay? So, so we do this experiment for different wettability, so different contact angles and uh, different capillary numbers. So on the x-axis going from left to right, uh, we go from strong drainage to strong inhibition and on the y-axis going from bottom to top, we go from relatively low capillary number to high capillary number. So we can see that we have a variety of different patterns and different colors, uh, which will analyze them in a little bit more detail. So if we were to focus on the bottom row, which corresponds to a low capillary number invasion, you can see that in general, going from left to right, so going from uh, strong drainage where the invading fluid is non-wetting to, uh, to the invading fluid being more wetting, we get more compact displacement, right? So more of the oil is being displaced. So uh, this uh, problem has actually been studied theoretically back in the 1980s by Chaplak and Robbins, where they hypothesized that when, when the invading fluid is more wetting to the solid uh, material, you're going to have what they termed cooperative pore filling. And that's a process where you have two fluid interfaces that meet on the same uh, solid grain or the same post in our system. And then they merge and then they form a uh, single interface and that allows you to achieve a compact displacement pattern. So this is uh, indeed what we um, observe in our experiments. So you can see in the post that highlighted in pink, you can see that we have interfaces that meet on these uh, pink posts and then they merge and they form a single uh, interface. And then now the interface is able to uh, advance smoothly ahead in a compact displacement pattern. Okay, so uh, knowing what we know so far, uh, going to uh, this system here, one would imagine, okay, if you want to achieve a more and more compact displacement, or if you want to displace more and more of the oil, you would like to decrease the contact angle more, right? So it turns out that it's only true up to a point. So if we were to look at the last two columns here, you can see that when we decrease the contact angle from 60 degrees to seven degrees, 
there the displacement pattern completely changes, right? So in the sense that um, now instead of having more compact displacement, we have significantly less compact displacement when the contact angle is seven degrees. So then the uh, the question is, okay, why that is? So let's look at a movie of um, a displacement in the weak inhibition regime. So in this case, the contact in water is 60 degrees. And what you can see is that the invading fluid propagates by displacing the defending fluid from the poor bodies of our system. And if you were to look at the saturation, you can see that most of the oil across the gap is being displaced. And that's because the color of the displacement pattern is mostly yellow and white, right? So according to color bar, that means that most of the oil is being displaced. So if we were to look at the movie of a strong inhibition experiment where the water is strongly wetting at the same capillary number, we see a dramatically different invasion pattern. In this case, we see that the invading fluid, instead of displacing the oil from the pore bodies, they propagate by coating the adjacent post or the adjacent solids via corner flow. So corner flow occurs as a result of capillarity. So what do we mean by corner? So remember our, our cell has these posts and we have the bottom plate and the, and the top plate. So this is a post and this is say the top plate. And there here we have a corner, right? So which is a very sharp feature. And this is the area where we can see the wetting fluid is able to form a meniscus that has a, a negative curvature that creates a suction uh, that allows the fluid to coat the post, right? So by using very simple geometric, geometric arguments, we can say that the maximum contact angle for corner flow uh, for a right angled uh, corner is going to be 45 degrees. And that, that's why we uh, didn't see corner flow when we had a uh, contact angle of 60 degrees. So if we want to uh, look at the corner flow process in a little bit more detail, uh, we can look at the pore scale view of this process. And you can see that indeed the invading fluid propagates without filling the pore bodies. And instead they coat neighboring posts. And then between these neighboring posts, we have pendular rings of water. Let's play the movie uh, one more time. Okay, so um, this wraps up the first uh, story that I want to tell you, which is that fluid fluid displacement uh, in the regime of strongly wetting invading fluid is dominated by corner flow, which leads to incomplete displacement at the pore scale by allowing the invading fluid to bypass the pore bodies. And there exists a optimal wetting condition at which displacement is maximized. So uh, this work was pu published quite a while ago, um, but even as we were doing that work in the back of my, our mind, uh, we were constantly thinking, okay, no natural porous media, especially porous media underground has just one single contact angle, right? So all natural porous media are mixed wet uh, in the sense that they have spatially heterogeneous wettability. So there's always different contact angles. So more recently, people had um, tried to measure the contact angle of these materials in situ. And um, what we know so far is that 60% of the known oil reserve, uh, reserves is in carbonate formations, and 80% of carbonate formations have strongly mixed wettability, and that has implications for uh, CO2 flooding, so for CO2-enhanced oil recovery. So when people had looked at the contact angle distribution of a um, single rock core, as shown in the image on the bottom left here, we can see that even on the order of a length scale of say uh, 100 micron, uh, we can see different contact angles as indicated by the color map here, which goes from 40 degrees to, si to 70 degrees. Uh, so that work was done in 2020. So in a separate study that was done in 2017, uh, when we plot the histogram of the 
contact angles for three different types of rocks, you see that all of them have a wide range of contact angle distributions, right? So then uh, we want to see whether we can use the same system that we developed earlier on to try to study the problem of multiphase flow in mixed wet porous media. So that is the uh, project that my PhD student Ashkan Iran has that, uh, took on. And the approach that he took was very simple. So he said that, okay, uh, we know there is a wide distribution of contact angles, but let's try to analyze the simplest case where instead of having just a single contact angle, let's try to have two contact angles, right? And let's see what happens. So he was able to achieve spatially heterogeneous wet abilities with the application of a UV blocking mask using the same polymer material, no ID1, which becomes more hydrophilic when it, when, um, it uh, is subject to high energy UV. Right. So by using a mask, uh, we can block the UV. So the area that is exposed to UV is going to become more hydrophilic, while the rest is not. Right. So he used a series of precip perception uh, stages uh, and microscope, and he was able to carefully align the top and bottom pieces, the flow cell, uh, with the mask during wettability treatment, and also to each other during cell assembly. Uh, so, so this is very important because we, we want to have the same whatever distribution between the bottom surface and top surface. I want to put them together and want to make sure that the uh, boundaries between the different whatabilities align. So that took a while, uh, but he was very successful at doing it. So in, instead of just creating one single mixed wet cell, he created two types of mixed wet cell. So on the left here, we have a uh, cell that's primarily oil wet, has a contact angle of 120 degrees, but interspersed with water wet clusters uh, showing blue here that has a contact angle of 30 degrees. And on the right, we have a flow cell that is again primarily oil wet with a contact angle of 120 degrees, but now the water wet clusters has a contact angle of 60 degrees. So before I play uh, the movie of these two experiments, I would just like the audience to kind of uh, imagine in their mind how the water would percolate through these water wet uh, clusters. Just um, give a couple of seconds. Okay, so I'll play the movie and see whether that matches your imagination. Okay, so, so, so we see that simply by changing the contact angle of the water wet clusters by 30 degrees, we achieve completely different uh, behavior, right? So specifically, the invading water, which is shown in yellow here, they preferentially fills the water wet clusters that has a contact angle of 30 degrees. But this is very much not the case when the water wet cluster has a contact angle of 60 degrees. In this case, the water advances by encircling uh, these uh, more weakly wet uh, water clusters instead of saturating them, which is counterintuitive, right? So um, intuitively, we think that because, because the cluster of water wet, water would just naturally saturate them, right? So then we try to understand what's going on. Um, and Ashkan uh, did uh, these experiments over uh, different capillary numbers. So going from left to right, we're increasing the capillary number, which means that the viscous effects are more important. And, and, and we can see this transition uh, in behavior. So if we were to try to be a little bit more quantitative, so we defined two metrics. The first metric that we measure is what we refer to as the water wet poor preference index IP. And that's simply defined as the ratio of the number of invaded water wet pores to number of invaded mixed wet pores. So that figure is shown on the bottom left here, where on the y axis we're plotting IP, and on the x axis we're plotting the capillary number. So you can see on the top here we have a gray dashed line, and that gray dashed line is indicating 
the total number of water wet pores to the total number, the ratio between the total number of water wet pores to the number of total, to the total number of mixed wet pores. So you'll see that when we have a water wet cluster that is 30 degrees, the uh, IP that we get is very close to that limit, which means that whenever a water sees a mixed wet pore in the uh, in clusters that has three degree contact angle, it's going to fill all of the water uh, in its path. Right, all it's going to fill all of the water wet pores in its path. Right, whereas it's very much not the case um, for water wet clusters that has contact angle of sixty degrees, which has much much lower values of IP. Right, so another uh, metric that we define is the water wet cluster displacement efficiency ED, which is the fraction of the defending fluid or the defending oil that is displaced from the water wet clusters closest to the injection port. And, and here, again, we see that when we have clusters that has a contact angle of 30 degrees, the displacement efficiency ED is much higher compared to water wet clusters that has a contact angle of 60 degrees. So another note that I would like to point out here is that as we increase the value of the capillary number, the behavior between the uh, strongly water wet cluster with fixed 30 degree contact angle and the uh, weakly water wet uh, cluster with degree uh, contact angle 60 degrees, their behavior kind of converge at high capillary numbers. So because capillary number is measuring the relative importance between viscous forces and capillary forces, that tells us, okay, what is driving the difference between uh, the two systems is capillarity, right? So to understand this problem a little bit better, we simulated the quasi-static evolution of the fluid-fluid interface in three dimensions using Surface Evolver, which is an open source software that tries to minimize the overall surface energy of the fluid-fluid solid system. So here's a typical simulation where we have a hydrophobic or an oil wet post on the left and a hydrophilic or water wet post on the right. And what we see that is that the fluid fluid interface takes a shape of an sort of an S shaped um, saddle. And um, the color here as, indic by, as indicated by the color bar is the mean curvature. So we can see that in this case, um, of course, the mean curvature is the same at different points along our meniscus. And that makes perfect sense because the meniscus is in a static equilibrium. But we can also see that the value is close to zero. So now what we can do is we can simulate uh, the uh, meniscus shape for different scenarios. So we started with two simple scenarios. So the first on the left here, we simulated the meniscus shape between two water wet posts. Both of them have a contact angle of 60 degrees and we obtain the shape of the meniscus with its corresponding uh, curvature, which is indicated by the color bar here. And then we simulated the meniscus shape a, at a mixed wet pore throat, uh, which is made of a post with a contact angle of 120 degrees and another water wet post with a contact angle of 60 degrees. So again, here we see this S-shaped um, saddle whose mean curvature um, is around zero. So now what we can see here is that because capillary entry pressure or capillary pressure in general is given by surface tension multiplied by curvature. So if we have a lower curvature than the entry pressure, so the amount of pressure you need to invade that pore throat is lower, right? So what this is telling us is that it's actually more preferential for the water to invade the mixed wet pores compared to the uniform wet uh, water wet pores in our system when we have 120 degree and 60 degree contact angle distribution, right? So that explains what we see. Um, and, but this is very much not the case when we change the contact angle where now our water wet posts have a contact angle of 30 degrees and our mixed wet uh, pore throat have a contact angle of 120 and 30 degrees. And if we look at the value of the mean curvature, you can see that on the left, we have a mean curvature from minus 0 0.1 to 
And again, for the mixed wet pore, we have a con we have a curvature of around zero. So in that case, it is more favorable for water to invade the fully water wet pores compared to the mixed wet pores. So that explains the difference uh, between what we see in the experiments. Right? And um, so, so we see these S-shaped meniscus in our, um, in our simulations using uh, surface evolver. And do we see them in the experiments? And um, Ashkan lo looked at the experiments using a microscope. And indeed, we see these S-shaped meniscus popping up at the mixed wet pores. So that's also very reassuring. So next, what we try to do is we'll try to see whether we can simulate this problem just using a very simple modeling approach. And specifically, the approach that we use is referred to as port network modeling. And port network modeling basically idealizes a porous media as a network of pores and throats. And again, we go back to the classic work of Chaplak and Robbins. And what they said is that we need to consider three main mechanisms of uh, pore invasion. And if we account for all these, then you should be able to account the impact of wettability on multiphase flow in porous media. So the first uh, invasion mechanism, uh, which they term uh, burst, which is the case where you have an interface, uh, which is highlighting red here, and you grow and you grow and grow until you can no longer find a solution that satisfies your contact angle constraint, then um, what they say is that the interface is going to burst, meaning that it's going to separate into two new interfaces, um, which is shown in black here. So the second mechanism is touch, and that's the case where you have an interface that grows and grows until it touches the next post. And the last one is overlap, which we already discussed earlier on, which is a case where you have a post and you have two interfaces that meet and then they merge and form a new uh, interface. So uh, more recently, uh, Prim Kulov et al. incorporated this framework developed by Chepek and Robbins and added viscous effects. Now we have a dynamic four network model, uh, which accounts for the impact of viscous dissipation. So what they did was that they drew the analogy of uh, multiphase flow in porous media with electrical circuits, where the resistance here is capturing the viscous dissipation and the uh, batteries and capacitors is capturing the impact of capillary forces or capillary pressure. So what we did was we took uh, the framework from those guys and we see if we can incorporate what, our, what we have uh, learned at the pore scale at a pore at a mixed wet pore to incorporate into those models. And to do that, we uh, derived an analytical solution for the fluid-fluid interface evolution through mixed wet pores. And we can see that our analytical solution, which is given by the red line here, matches the numerical simulation given by surface of Auburn. Okay, so now that we have these capillary entry pressures that we can input into the pore network models, um, we can uh, again, have the three main types of invasion mechanisms that's going to allow us to capture the impact of wettability. So we have a uh, burst for a mixed wet pore, touch for a mixed wet pore, and also overlap events for a mixed wet pore. Um, so uh, these are going to be our simulation results. So so what you can see is that our simple pore network model is able to capture the phenomenon that we observe in the experiments in the sense that when we have more strongly wetting water wet clusters, the water is going to preferentially fill these water wet clusters. Whereas when we have more weakly water wet clusters, you can see that the water doesn't like to infiltrate the water clusters and instead encircles these clusters, right? So that's the canonical finding that we um, achieved from the experiment. And this is the full phase diagram of our numerical simulations. And again, they match our experiments very well. And if we were to measure the quantitative metrics, um, IP and ED from our simulations, uh, which is shown in square here, 
and compare that to our experimental measurements, which is shown in circle here, we can see that again, they match very closely with each other. Okay, so to summarize this part of the work, uh, we found that a significant amount of oil can be trapped in the water wet clusters during water flooding, which was somewhat counterintuitive. And we find that the behavior of the fluid fluid displacement in mixed wet forest media is sensitive to the exact contact angle of the water wet regions. Um, so that's going to lead to um, sort of more careful thinking when you want to uh, make predictions in the field. So uh, this, we, uh, this work was very, very recently published in Physical Review Fluids, uh, I think just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Sure. Oh, here. Oh, okay. So, um, so, so, so that's the end of our simulation. So we define uh, the end of our simulation as the time when the water breaks through to the edge of the cell. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, 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 so that that's just how long it took uh, for the water to reach the edge of the cell, and 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 that kind of makes sense because you can see that in the case where the water wet cluster has a contact uh, contact angle of 30 degrees, the uh, water is more space filling, right? Which means that it takes longer for it to reach uh, the, the perimeter of the cell compared to uh, the other case. Yeah. Okay, Alex, uh, how am I doing on time? How much time do I have? Okay. Okay, so, so I'll just very briefly talk about the, uh, the last story of my talk, uh, which is on the topic of polymer electrolyte membrane or PEM electrolyzers. Um, and that is a promising technology for renewable energy storage. And uh, PEM electrolyzers generate hydrogen and hydrogen is an energy dense and versatile fuel that can be used to uh, in fuel cells to produce um, electricity on demand. So in order to for the systems to become economically competitive, what we want to do is to improve their efficiency. So just a very uh, brief overview. Um, we have a PEM electrolyzer and on the anode, we are generating oxygen gas and hydrogen protons and hydrogen proton is going to be transported through a membrane and it's going to be reduced and produce hydrogen gas on the cathode. So on the anode, uh, typically, uh, we have a porous transport layer, which is a porous material. And the role of the porous transport layer is to provide electrical con uh, contact, mechanical support, and reactant delivery. So one issue that um, uh, people have encountered is that because on the anode, we're producing oxygen gas, and now we have a multi-phase problem where, where we have water and gas. And because of capillary forces, the oxygen gas can be trapped in the pore spaces in the porous transport layer. And this is bad because it's going to block uh, water from, um, from reaching the reaction sites and that creates a lot of inefficiency. So uh, we can quantify inefficiency uh, by plotting the potential as a function of current. And we can see is that the inefficiency is reflected in higher operating potential at a given current. So for uh, a given current, you want to reduce the amount of uh, potential, right? Um, because uh, power is just a product of potential and current. So if you reduce potential, then you reduce the operating power. So the question that we ask ourselves is, can we engineer the wettability of these porous transport layers to improve the efficiency of PEM electrolyzers. So we uh, treated a um, commercial porous transport layer uh, to make it super hydrophilic. Uh, so if we, if I play these two movies here, uh, you can see that on the left, which is an untreated porous transport layer, uh, that it takes a lot longer for the water to imbibe into the untreated porous transport layer compared to the treated one, which we have made 
super hydrophilic. And the treated one, you can see that as soon as the water touches the porous transport layer, um, it, it completely disappears. And, and, and that's because the capillary section is so high, you can't even see the process of the water going in because as soon as the water drop is touching it, it's gone, right? So then the question is whether by using a super hydrophilic porous transport layer indeed improve the efficiency of uh, PEM electrolyzers. And the answer is yes. So in these two plots here on the left, I'm plotting the potential of an operating uh, PEM electrolyzer as a function of current. We can see that the blue symbols correspond to the PEM electrolyzer cell that is equipped with a super hydrophilic porous transport layer. You can see that achieves lower um, potential. And specifically, the difference can be as high as 10% or sorry, 20% at high current, which is quite significant. And if we decompose the contributions of the overpotential into ohmic overpotential, kinetic overpotential, and mass transport overpotential, which is shown on the right graph here, we can see that most of the difference comes from mass transport overpotential, which means that by having a super hydrophilic porous transport layer, indeed, we're improving the mass transport uh, performance of our device. So then in order to uh, have a little bit better understanding of what's going on, we took uh, our um, PEM electrolyzer and we went to the uh, NIST Center for Neutron Research and we imaged the operating electrolyzers using Neutron. And the advantage of using Neutron is that Neutron is highly attenuated by water, but uh, it passes through most metals freely so we can see inside the electrolyzer. So we focused our beam path at the anode porous transport layer. And because neutron is highly attenuated by water, and that allows us to see the amount of gas saturation in the porous transport layer. So here I am showing the gas saturation of two operating porous uh, transport layers. On the top, we have a, a treated porous transport layer. Uh, so according to the color bar here, you can see that it barely had any gas in there. Uh, whereas for an untreated um, porous transport layer, you can see that there is a lot of uh, gas built up. And if we were to plot the histogram of gas saturation, which is shown on the x-axis here, for the treated porous transport layer on the top and the untreated porous transport layer on the bottom, you can see that they look very different, specifically as we incrementally increase the current density. You can see that in the treated porous transport layer, the amount of gas saturation increase is much, much smaller compared to the untreated porous transport layer. And again, if we were to look at the width of the distribution, we can see that the untreated porous transport layer has a much wider distribution. And what that means is that as we increase the current density, we're going to have regions in the porous transport layer where the gas saturation is very close to one. And again, when you have a gas saturation very close to one, then it becomes very hard for the water, which is a reactant, to get to the catalyst site. And that creates a lot of inefficiencies. So, Lastly, we want to have an even uh, deeper understanding of what's going on um, um, in terms of water inhibition into the porous transport materials. And uh, to do that, we made, again, microfluidic cells where we took two acrylic plates and when we sandwich a porous transport layer in the middle and we supply water via a flow channel at the bottom and we see the water inhibition process and here's the movie of what we observed. And we, what you can see is that number one, it takes a significantly longer time for water to imbibe the untreated porous transport layer. Whereas on the right, the water inhibition through the porous transport layer is much more swift. And if I were to play that movie again, you can see that the mode of water invasion is also very different. Specifically, in the superhydrophilic porous transport layer, water inhibition is led by a precursor front of corner flow, and uh, that allows the system to rapidly 
be replenished with water. And in this case, the corner flow occurs at the crevice between two center titanium grains. Uh, so the crevice allows the water to form um, a corner flow that allows the rapid uh, advancement of water. So I'll play that one more time. So when we analyze the uh, change in potential of uh, these PEM electrolyzers operating at extremely high current density, and in this case it's A amps per centimeter squared. So the red line corresponds to the PEM electrolyzer cell that is equipped with an untreated pore transport layer. And you can see that as soon as we turn on the cell, the, we have runaway potential and, 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 and that the cell is that we can no longer operate the, uh, the cell. Whereas the black line is showing the uh, changes in potential for a PEM electrolyte cell with super hydrophilic porous transport layer. And in this case, we see a lot of oscillations in the potential. And what we hypothesize is that these oscillations uh, corresponds to the replenishment of water through, um, through corner flow. And, and the reason for that is if we were to zoom in and uh, the time scale between uh, these, uh, the period between these oscillations is on the order of a couple of seconds, which, is cor which corresponds to how fast the corner flow permeates through a super hydrophilic porous transport layer. So even though the current is very, very high, so as soon as the water uh, touches the reaction site, it, it becomes all of it converted, but because the corner flow is very fast, it can allow the reaction to sustain itself. So to summarize this part of the talk, super hydrophilic porous transport layer significantly increase the efficiency of PEM electrolyzers and electrical analysis, electrochemical analysis and inoperando neutron imaging demonstrates that the improved efficiency indeed stems from reduced gas, gas saturation and improved water delivery. And we perform some microfluidics experiments, which shows that capillary driven corner flow is a key physical mechanism responsible for reducing the oxygen gas saturation and enhanced liquid water transport. Uh, so this work was published in uh, 2021 in Cell Reports Physical Science. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, which I hope I was prepared for. <laughs> so, so, so we use uh, so we use Beer Lambert law. So, um, so specifically, uh, we try to change. So, so um, we have a shim uh, between the two plates where we can uh, vary the thickness, um, but we don't. We we cannot have many many data points. So, in addition, we also change the concentration. And, and then we, uh, we demonstrated that by changing the thickness and changing the concentration, you can achieve the same effect. Then we can use the same Beer-Lambert law calibration curve for both. And, and, and that's how we were able to uh, get the film thickness. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, that would that would require me. To, so, so as I, so, so we had the uh, similar question from the reviewers as we submitted the paper. So, so in the in in the uh, in, in in the supplemental material uh, of, of our paper, you'll find. Um, uh, different realizations of the same experiment, the same, uh, uh, I'm sorry, different realizations of the experiment at the same conditions. And you'll see that uh, they're pretty similar to each other. Okay. 
How do you choose the four densities? Does that mean you've got the, you're choosing a certain range of, of filler diameters, and you've got a gap between them? There's mm -hmm. parameters here to play with. What's sort of the, I'm curious how you sort of think through the time that you go through. Yeah, so the, um, so the thinking is we try to make the length scale of the pore throw to be on the same order of the gap thickness. So, so we don't want a elongated pore either in this direction or that direction. Um, so, so, so that was our, our, our thinking. Yeah. So along those lines, so the, the pillars are all different diameters or are they uniform? Because it looks like they're all different diameters. They're different. Yeah, yeah. So is there any advantage to having them be all uniform or identical mm -hmm. in spaces in array or? Yeah, so, so, when we, so when we first started the project, uh, we started with a very simple lattice. So, so just a very simple uh, rectilinear lattice. And, and we had uh, the same post size everywhere. And then we did the experiment, which is very interesting, but much, much less and much, much less realistic compared to what I showed here. So, so, so that, that, that's why we moved to a more disordered system. But then again, we don't want it to be too disordered that we cannot draw any uh, generic conclusions from the experiments. So that's why we try to make a system where we say it's macroscopically homogeneous, but locally we have disorders because the posts do have different sizes. Um, so in order to do that, what we did was we uh, take a circle um, and then we use the uh, PDE toolbox in MATLAB, or, or you can use any mesh generation, uh, gen mesh generating uh, algorithm. So, so we um, have uh, triangular meshes, and then we use the vertices, the triangular meshes as the point or the center where we put the posts, and then we put the posts, and then we uh, additionally uh, uh, constrain them so that we don't have overlap. And then we also constrain them such that the uh, pore throat is not too small that they cannot be fabricated using photolithography, and they're not too large so that the aspect ratio between the gap thickness and the pore throat is too out of whack. So that's kind of how we design the system. Right. And then my next question is, mm -hmm. would it be more realistic to have beads than posts? I guess you, you can't really steal it if mm -hmm. there are beads of different size. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so we, so, so, so that's kind of an ongoing project that we have. So, uh, Mata, who's sitting here, uh, is, is working on the bead system. Um, so, the bead system uh, is a little bit more complicated because, um, so, so in the post system, we can um, quite confidently treat them as a quasi 2D system, where when we have beads, uh, then we really have a truly 3D system um, because now, say we have uh, two plates with a bead, uh, then we have corner for the top and the bottom. And then we, when, when the two beads touch, then there is a pendular ring right in the middle. Then um, in order to uh, think about that problem a little bit, we really need to go deeper into three dimensions. So that's something that we're act uh, actively working on. Thank you, Robin, one more time for being a speaker.